Okay, welcome everybody on today's headline. Today we have three very interesting and very special talks. Uh, first of all, we have a little visit to Damiano Capioli from Princeton, uh, who is an associate research scholar there, and he will tell us about ultra high energy cosmic rays. After that, Lacey Burkhardt will, uh, will speak, and she, who is a nice time fellow in CFA, and she will tell us about measuring energy turbulence in the ISM using synchrotron fluctuations. And finally, we will have a very interesting talk given uh, by Ralph Kraft, who is an astrophysicist at SAO, and he will tell us about uh, the Vito mission, which is, a, which is a discovery proposal to study the outer solar system and the Oort cloud. So, Damiano, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me, and thank you for the organizer for for scheduling my talk on quite a short, uh, short notice. So today I will uh, outline a novel uh, model for the acceleration of ultra-high energy cosmic rays. And uh, as you're probably familiar, cosmic rays were discovered more than 100 years ago by Victor Hess, who discovered that the level of ionizing radiation increases with altitude. And uh, this means that there must be something extraterrestrial that is bombarding uh, uh, the atmosphere. And, uh, other people, uh, in the, like Auguste Picard in the 30s, uh, were the first, the first, he was the first one uh, reaching the stratosphere with uh, just a, a pressurized aluminum gondola and uh, attached to a balloon. And he is, he, he is with a, he is a, a assistant just with these rudimental helmets with pillows because, you know, 16 kilometers uh, up there, it's quite turbulent. And uh, in the 40s, people realized that uh, these cosmic rays can, uh, are, can be very energetic and trigger uh, extensive air shower when they interact with, uh, with the atmosphere. And uh, today, uh, we know that uh, we have uh, the spectrum of cosmic rays covered over several decades in energy, and there are a lot of experiments that can be basically di divided into direct detections with satellites and balloons with all 10 to the 6 GeV, so 1 PeV. And above these energies, you have to rely on ground-based arrays and fluorescent stereoscopes that basically tend to reconstruct the chemical composition and the energy of primary cosmic rays based on the property of the showers that they trigger. And uh, uh, the most remarkable uh, feature of, of cosmic ray spectrum is that it's, it, it is almost a, a, a perfect power law with the energy uh, spectral index of 2.7 over 12 orders of magnitude. There are some features, though, like the so-called knee, where the spectrum becomes a little bit steeper, uh, steeper, and uh, an ankle when the, it flattens again. And then the most natural question is, what is the mechanism that can accelerate particles with such a nice uh, 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 feature? And uh, uh, the uh, simplest idea that you can envision is the so-called Hilas criterion, in which you want, uh, for the acceleration of particles up to a given energy, that the larval radius of, of these, uh, at this energy to be encompassed by the size of the system, of the accelerator. So if you plot the typical size and magnetic fields for astrophysical objects, you see that there are some thresholds, such that uh, uh, acceleration up to a given energy can only be achieved if the magnetic field is large enough or if the size is large enough. And... Uh, uh, Roughly, according to this uh, criterion, cosmic rays below 10 to the 16, 10 to the 17 electron volts can be accelerated in our galaxy because above this energy, the Larvan radius exceeds the size of the galaxy in the typical interstellar magnetic field. Therefore, high energy cosmic rays, what you usually uh, refer to uh, ultra high energy cosmic rays of cosmic rays above 10 to the 18 electron volts up to more than 10 to the 20, must be of extragalactic origin. And if you look at the, the source candidates, they are almost invariably relativistic objects, like uh, gamma ray burst, uh, AGNs, uh, and uh, newly born uh, pulsars. So uh, the, as, since co galactic cosmic rays are uh, now proved to be accelerated in supernova remnants at the blast waves, at the shocks of the supernova remnants, the most natural way 
the, no the most natural place where to look for acceleration of ultra high energy cosmic rays would be relativistic shocks. So if you have a, a conversion of, a, the shock is just conversion of kinetic energy into heat if you want, but if a particle impinges on the shock with a given uh, angle, the given inclination, and uh, comes back into the upstream, you can, uh, with, a, with a different inclination, uh, you can simply show that, so if you take the initial momentum and the uh, initial energy EI, and uh, you convert this energy into the downstream frame, and you assume that in the downstream the particle undergoes an elastic scattering, which you can also see as, an, as a, a gyration around the magnetic field, and then you convert, if for some process the particle comes back into the upstream, the final energy in the upstream reference frame, which is this simple uh, Lorentz boost, is a, a factor of gamma squared, where gamma is the Lorentz factor of the bulk flow, times uh, the initial energy, plus this uh, correction that depends on the uh, incoming and the outgoing angles. So the energy gain depends uh, on how these two directions of flights are uncorrelated. And uh, if you see that if for almost, uh, if they are uncorrelated, the particle comes back with a factor of gamma squared in energy. And uh, of course, uh, if the inclinations are, are, are the same, the particle, the energy gain is just a factor of two. So that's why if a particle crosses the shock, it gains a boost of a factor of two. But then when, since uh, the particle will fly out along the direction of propagation of the shock, but if it is deflected just a little bit, the shock recatches it. So the second cycle will be less effective because the ingoing and the outgoing angles are correlated now. So we'll all, we'll be less efficient, just a factor of two in energy. But it's not obvious that particles can actually return back into the shock because this surface is moving away at almost C, right? So uh, we would like to twist a little bit this configuration and speak about uh, acceleration and relativistic flows. So if you have a let's say a laboratory, which is now our downstream frame, and you have a, a, like a jet or a relativistic flow, and a particle that has a Larmor radius larger than the uh, thickness of the interface, the boundary layer between the jet and the medium, but uh, smaller than the transverse size of the flow, the particle can enter the jet, gyrate around the magnetic field, and either if it leaves the shock in this, uh, if it leaves the flow, at the termination shock or sideways, as long as the initial and the outgoing angle are different by more than uh, 90 degrees, it will gain a factor of gamma squared in energy. So this is a very general configuration that you can, that you can think about as a Compton scattering with a relativistic particle, which is the flow. Or if you want, and the actual source of energization is the motion or the electric field that the particle sees uh, because of the magnetic fields in the, in the flow. Uh, therefore, the idea is uh, how to produce uh, high energy cosmic rays uh, by taking an espresso. You see these are very similar systems because uh, if you start, uh, uh, let's remember that galaxies have uh, an halo of cosmic rays, the, the, of the extent of a few kiloparsec. And so we have plenty of seeds. And seeds are just galactic cosmic rays, which are accelerated in supernova remnants, and they have energies up to uh, three times the charge of the nucleus. This is, will be quite important in a second. Uh, times uh, uh, 10 to the 6 uh, GeV. And uh, if you propagate a steam through these seeds, and the steam uh, is an AGN jet with a Lorentz factor of 20, 30, which are inferred from multi-wavelength observation of lasers, you can have one shot acceleration, and that's why I, I called it espresso acceleration, that can produce ultra high energy cosmic rays with energies a factor of 1,000 larger than the energy at the knee. And these are consistent with the maximum energies observed in uh, uh, ultra high energy cosmic rays. And uh, you can uh, check that the confinement criterion, so the HILAS criterion is satisfied for typical magnetic fields and the typical extent of the jets. But it's quite important that you need the, the particles at 10 to the 20 to be iron nuclei. This will be, will be important in a second. 
and you can also check the energetics. Uh, this is the total energy that is required to power the flux of ultra energy cosmic rays. And if you take the typical energy, the typical bolometric luminosity of AGNs and their abundances, this is much larger. So you need just 10 to the 10 to minus 3, 10 to minus 5 efficiency in order to power the energy in uh, the, the luminosity in ultra energy cosmic rays. The efficiency depends on the intrinsic uh, acceleration efficiency. Also on the jet cross section, but if this is even for an opening angle of a few degrees, you can process a few percent, up to 10% of the total cosmic rays in the galaxy. So this is intrinsically uh, quite uh, uh, efficient. And you can uh, uh, look at what kind of sources uh, are responsible for this. And it must be radio loud quasars, uh, blazers, uh, uh, FR1, and, and so on. So the idea is that if you have, uh, uh, now we try to a uh, global explanation of the spectrum of cosmic rays. So the knee is observed to be uh, due to the superposition of uh, cutoffs of different species. These cutoffs are proportional to the charge of the nucleus. So they are accelerated, particles are accelerated in a rigidity dependent way. Therefore, the maximum energy scales with Z. And the relative abundances uh, of different species is such that you get this steepening at the knee. And uh, then if you boost uh, this uh, uh, population of cosmic rays with these abundances by a factor of gamma square, you can reproduce the spectrum of ultra energy cosmic rays. Uh, there are the, I'm finishing with just this. The natural prediction of this mechanism is that the chemical composition of ultra energy cosmic rays must uh, match the composition in the knee region. It's pretty uh, heavy. There are a lot of iron nuclei at the highest energies. And these uh, uh, color bands are the observed spectrum and uh, chemical composition. Uh, there are a few caveats, but uh, these are discussed uh, in, uh, in the paper that will be uh, on the archive soon. And uh, I leave you with this cosmic ray uh, summary of what are the sources of low energy cosmic rays and high energy cosmic rays according to this uh, espresso idea. Thank you. So, Camiano, GRBs have gammas another factor of 10 larger, yep. or even 30. So they will have yet another component in what you predict, predict at yet higher energy? Uh, I think that uh, the, so, it is in principle possible, but the cross section of the of the uh, gamma ray burst uh, jet is rather small. It's not going to reprocess most of the cosmic rays in the galaxy. So it may be uh, locally important, uh, but I don't think that they can contribute uh, to the uh, number and to the chemical composition, which you don't expect to be. Uh, you cannot uh, accelerate particles for, for, from scratch. I think that the. An interesting ingredient of this mechanism is that the chemical composition of ultra energy cosmic rays matches the chemical composition at the knee. And this suggests this reacceleration scenario. And it turns out that the uh, gamma factor that you need is of order of 2030, which is maybe just a, 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 by chance, but uh, may be telling us something. But you're also predicting that it's going to turn over. Yeah. Go much beyond 20. Oh, yeah. Even the iron will run out, right? Yeah, and the idea is that usually this was invoked to be uh, the uh, grass ends at Sepin exactly. Kuzmin uh, cut off due to the photopion produc production on, uh, on CMB photons. But if the highest energy particles are iron nuclei, then uh, CMB is not the major concern. And uh, the, these particles. Uh, 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 so the horizon is determined by photodisintegration and photodissociation of uh, iron nuclei. But it turns out that uh, the uh, radius of the horizon is pretty much the same. So you will always uh, expect a cutoff about 10 to the 20, even if they are iron nuclei.
Okay, so now we'll switch gears uh, a little bit and I will be discussing uh, measuring turbulence in the warm ionized medium uh, via uh, linear polarization uh, gradients. So this is uh, fluctuations in uh, synchrotron, radio synchrotron. And this uh, work was done with a collaboration that includes a number of, of people that are involved in both theory and observation. So first, it's always important to, to start out when anyone gives a talk about turbulence one should kind of motivate why do we want to study turbulence. Um, and the fact of the matter is that MHD turbulence, uh, that is turbulence with a, that includes a magnetic field and a partially or fully ionized gas, is relevant for a variety of different physical processes in astrophysics. We just heard a very nice talk about acceleration of cosmic rays with magnetic fields and turbulence are critical there. Reconnection of field lines, amplification from the dynamo process, uh, feedback, galaxy evolution, star formation, et cetera. So MHD turbulence really touches on a, a wide range of scales and problems in astrophysics. And uh, in particular, for the warm ionized phase of our Milky Way galaxy, there's a number of different tracers uh, in which to study this. And one, of course, is, uh, is uh, the uh, synchrotron emission. So if we just simply look at a map of total intensity of the galactic plane, this is 1.4 gigahertz map from the Southern Galactic Plane Survey, which is an inter uh, interferometer survey, one can see very classical ISM features. So things like H2 regions, supernova remnants, and then these, these points uh, are often uh, extragalactic sources. So this is a very nice and, and familiar picture for most of us. However, if we look in linear polarization, so the same image, uh, uh, same data of the galactic plane, one sees a very different picture in linear polarization. In particular, it looks basically nothing like the total intensity map. And so for a long time, researchers were quite puzzled, why do you get these sort of uh, filamentary uh, structures in linear polarization? And of course, it's related um, to what's going on along the line of sight uh, from uh, different structures in the uh, galactic ISM to the telescope. Of course, this is known as the Faraday rotation, which is rotating uh, the angle of polarization. And this rotation is proportional to the, uh, the electron density along the line of sight and the magnetic field along the line of sight. Now, of course, turbulence, uh, our classical picture of turbulence, will include fluctuations along the line of sight in N, E, and B. And so therefore, this, this different structures in the linear polarization map could well be due to a turbulent ISM along the line of sight. Now we can, of course, study this uh, not only in, uh, in simulation, in observations, as I've shown here, but we can also do things with simulation. So we can create synthetic maps of linear polarization using MHD simulations, and also synthetic rotation measure maps. Now interestingly, it's it's one, it's one thing to look at the linear polarization. One can see a lot of different structures here. But there's an observational motivation for, instead of looking at the actual linear polarization map, to look at gradients, so spatial gradients of the linear polarization map. Um, and, and this has to do with some details of interferometers. But from a theorist uh, point of view, and I'm a theorist, so I'll, I'll discuss a more of this theoretical motivation, a linear uh, polarization gradient is motivated also to the gradient of the rotation measure. And so from an observation point of view, getting the rotation measure, one needs a variety of different frequencies to extrapolate from linear polarization to rotation measure. But if one just has one frequency of, of linear polarization, the gradient of the linear polarization can be easily related to the gradient of the rotation measure. So in some sense, the gradient uh, of, of this sort of data is also quite well theoretically motivated. So I mentioned we can take uh, simulations, MHD simulations, and create these sort of polarization maps, and then also take their gradients. And so things become quite clear when one looks at two different cases, this is simulations now. So one where we have a, a high sonic Mach number, so Mach numbers of about, in this case, seven. And then a simulation where we have a subsonic flow. And right away, by eye, you can already see there's quite a number of differences between these maps. So for example, the intensity of the gradient of linear polarization in the supersonic case is quite a bit higher than the subsonic case. And also the structures look different. You have a lot more filamentary structures with these jump profiles. And here you just have this sort of clumpy looking profiles. And so we, were, we decided that one thing that would be very interesting to see if we can characterize the sonic Mach number in linear polarization gradient maps with different statistical techniques. So two that I'll be discussing quickly here are the topology of these types of maps and also the probability distribution functions. So basically, we have 
sonic Mach number, which is what we're interested in, and these two different statistical diagnostics, PDFs and, and the topology, which, which we will measure um, in a genus map. And it's also good to point out that in the warm ionized medium, there's many, many, many ways of, of measuring turbulence. So some more classical ways like scintillation and scattering. So this is, for example, where the big power law of electron uh, scintillation and scattering methods come from. And also the emission measure. So polarization gradients really just represent another way of, of studying turbulence in the warm ionized medium. So first I'll, I'll talk about PDFs to so this, this type of data, so probability distribution functions. And why are these related to the sonic Mach number? So actually, it's, it's quite simple. If one takes a, a column density map, so this is density in projection. So again, remember the rotation measure is, is related, uh, is proportional to density. So if I take a, a density map and I plot its corresponding PDF, things look quite Gaussian. Now what happens if I increase the sonic Mach number? So this is now a, a simulation with a sonic Mach number of 2. And we see that the corresponding PDF has gotten wider, the tail got slightly longer, and the peak got slightly peakier. So these moments of the PDF, the variance, skewness, and kurtosis, all increased with increasing Mach number. Now I can go to higher and higher Mach numbers, and this effect just continues to exaggerate itself. So now at Mach numbers of 8, we have very skewed distributions. The variance is, has increased. And the so-called kurtosis, which is measuring the, the peak of the distribution, has also increased. So we can apply these to these gradient of linear polarization maps and see what happens. And essentially, we see a very similar trend with actual density, which maybe isn't so surprising. So on the axis here, I've plotted uh, moments of the PDF, so mean, variance, skewness, and kurtosis. And on the x-axis, we have sonic Mach number. So these plots represent different simulations um, with both uh, different alpha and Mach numbers, so this is initial magnetic field. Uh, uh, one case with an alpha Mach number of 0.7, so this is our higher magnetic field case, and one with an alpha Mach number of 2, and then different Mach numbers along the x-axis. And one sees that there's both dependencies on sonic Mach number and, interestingly, on alpha Mach number. Again, this maybe isn't so surprising because the rotation measure depends both on the density and the magnetic field. So this suggests that linear polarization gradients in the observations, may be able to characterize uh, sonic and alpha and Mach numbers of the turbulent ISM along the line of sight. So we didn't want to just look at an intensity tracer like PDFs. We also saw that there's topology changes between different uh, maps with sonic, uh, subsonic and supersonic turbulence. And so for this, we can look at a topology measure. So one uh, such topology measure is the so-called genus statistic. Now, the genus, uh, you might be familiar with it, but for those that aren't, it's simply a way of telling if a, if a distribution or a structure has a more clump-like topology or a more whole-like topology. So this example um, of different structures, so simply it's counting numbers of holes. So this uh, torus-like shape would have a genus of 1, and as we increase the number of holes, the genus simply increases. So you're essentially just counting uh, either clumps or, or holes in the data. And this is why we can always make fun of topologists, because the joke on them is that they can't tell the difference between a donut and a, a coffee cup. They both have a genus of one. So essentially, we're able to distinguish between a Swiss cheese or a hole-like topology and a clump-like topology. Um, and one essentially, in practice, on an image, can think of this as contouring the data. You simply contour the data, and for a given threshold, you see if there's more clumps in your contour or more holes. And that gives you your genus at a given threshold. So we apply this to um, our simulated maps. So we have supersonic cases, subsonic cases, different magnetic field strengths. And we see what, uh, what kind of genus values we get. And so here's a plot of all the different simulations. This panel here is super alphinic, so a more dynamically unimportant magnetic field. And this panel is sub so a more dynamically important magnetic field. And on the x-axis here, I've plotted smoothing radius. And why? It's because, of course, in observations, we have uh, things like the instrumentation noise, the beam smoothing, et cetera. So in order to successfully apply any of these uh, techniques that we look at on, on simulations to observations, we need to take into account these sort of things. Now, interestingly, uh, you see clear differences between different sonic Mach number cases in these different colored lines, and also some differences between different magnetic field strengths. Again, this implies that the topology can be used in order to uh, 
determine the properties of turbulence in the warm ionized medium from this type of data. Um, so here, in, in terms of the normalization we've used, positive genus implies a whole like topology, and negative genus implies a clump-like topology. And so the supersonic uh, cases, maybe not surprisingly, you see this sort of hole-like structures at these, as these jumps where, where a shock is occurring. This, this sort of map has a hole-like topology, and this map has a clump-like topology. Now we've applied these techniques to different data. So in particular, the Southern Galactic Plane Survey, which is an interferometer um, survey. And the, in this particular case, we found that uh, Mach numbers using genus were about transonic to, to subsonic in this sort of data. And we also applied it to single dish data from the SPASS survey. And using both, both the genus and the PDFs, so looking again at the, the skewness, kurtosis, mean and variance of different regions in this data, again, the data seemed consistent with subsonic to transonic type turbulence. So to summarize, if you take one point away from my talk, just take away that MHD turbulence is important for a variety of studies, uh, including the warm ionized medium, which I've, I've motivated in this talk, and that polarization gradients really represent a, a more uh, novel and new way of, of measuring MHD turbulence um, in, in the ionized medium. And we've also applied these different techniques that we've um, developed on data, so in particular two different surveys, one an interferometer survey and one a single dish survey. And they're in uh, good, what we found in terms of the sonic Mach number is actually in good agreement with studies like Hill et al. in 2008, which looked at dispersion measure. And then finally, uh, in terms of future prospects, Polarization gradients will be uh, very, I think, important for assessing turbulence in, in terms of the accretion disk around Sag A star, which is upcoming with the Event Horizon Telescope. So I'd love to talk uh, more about this point with you. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's a really good question. So with the simulations, they're ideal MHD simulations, so they're scale-free. So we can scale them to a particular distance. We can scale the magnetic field and density to sort of fiducial values. And then we also know the telescope beam size, so we apply that as well but to this. essentially, you take the beam size. Exactly. length, and you compare it to the simulation, whatever that means. Right. And and, exactly. And we also found, in terms of the PDFs, that they were they're much more sensitive to the beam size. So the genus, uh, which I showed a plot as, as a function of beam size, is, is much less dependent on, on the beam size than the PDFs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What can produce a, a supersonic turbulence in the ISA? Um, well, a number of things. So if you have, for example, a supernova, uh, if, you're, if you're sampling a, a region around a supernova remnant, you can have weak shocks. Uh, weak shocks in those regions. And probably most of the, the supersonic... Uh, but shocks induce turbulence, either you know behind the shocks or, or in front of the shocks. So you can definitely have turbulent motions that are stirred by a shock passing through. But behind the shock, it's subsonic. Yeah, of course, but it's still turbulent, right? So in this particular type of data, I mean, we were able to determine roughly the percentage of um, of uh, uh, these different uh, uh, pieces of data, roughly the percentage where we would expect supersonic motions, and in general, it's, it's quite low. So most of the turbulence that we found in the warm ionized medium is pretty transonic to subsonic. I'm just going to plug into the HDMI connector.